All right. Well, I think we're we're two o'clock, so um, people will just continue to join as they as they log. In. But welcome to those who are here already, and welcome to those who will be watching the recording of this webinar. Um, <clears throat> I just wanted to get started here by introducing myself to the audience. Um, so for those that don't know who I am, um, my name's John Hembro. Um, my wife, Leanne, and I are the Down Under Rally. Um, we're full-time liveaboard cruisers for 12 years uh, with about 50,000 nautical miles under our keels on both monos and multis, the ones you can see pictured there. Um, our majority of our cruising has been done in the east coast of Queensland or east coast of Australia, I should say, and then the Pacific from uh, from um, uh, California down to Panama and then across the Pacific back to Australia. Um, so you can see there that uh, where we've been and what we've done. Um, <clears throat> in 2015, we started the first Down Under Rally. And uh, since then, we've returned from Australia to New Cal. Vanuatu and Fiji five times prior to COVID, um, putting an end to that for a little while. But we're back, a, back at it full steam. Um, those that are interested, we've done a few of these webinars over the last couple of years. And if you wanted to, if you were interested in the Southwest Pacific and New Caledonia and Vanuatu, and even particularly Queensland, for those that will be heading up the Queensland coast, great webinar here that we did with the author of uh, Cruising the Queensland Coast, Greg Luck. And he talks uh, about all the anchorages along the way and, and different things. So, yeah, those those webinars might be of interest for you uh, at some time in the future. It's on our YouTube channel um, at Down Under Rally. So just into YouTube and Down Under Rally and you'll find us there. Um, this year, we've got some rallies running. We're heading off to New Caledonia with a fleet of boats in May uh, and then onwards to Vanuatu with uh, the majority of those same boats uh, in August. We've got a rally coming from Fiji to New Caledonia and clearing into the Loyalty Islands in um, <clears throat> late September. And then of course, we've got our Go West rally, which brings all the boats back to Australia, the international cruising community, as well as the um, guys that have joined our Go East rally and are returning home. So if you're interested in the, in the rallies that we've got planned, um, you're more than welcome to jump on our website there and uh, have a look and, and see what it's all about. Um, just for those that haven't been offshore before, and we've got a very broad audience here today, we've got um, quite a number of people who have been past participants in our Go West Rally and international cruising yachts people who've arrived in Australia for cyclone season and are now starting to look at where they're going to go uh, from here. So some of the things I'm going to mention here won't be relevant to you if you're a visiting, if you're a yacht that's in Australia currently and visiting on a control permit, couple of these things won't be relevant to you but for those that are Australian vessels that are leaving Australia um, to head offshore uh, if you're not aware you need to be an Australian registered ship in order to do that and that's a process um, it's quite different from your Australian uh, from your local state registration and you'll need to uh, get in touch with AMSA just go to the AMSA website AMSA and have a look at uh, how to register your ship You'll need to allow at least two to three months for this process. Um, and you can expect it to cost you somewhere between $1,500 and $2,000. Um, and the good news is it's a one-off fee. So you don't have to pay it annually, but you will have to do that. If you're not Australian registered, when it comes time to leave the country, the Australian Border Force won't issue you with a outward clearance certificate. And without one of those, you won't be able to arrive at your destination. Well, you will be able to arrive, but they won't let you stay. So Australian registrations first and foremost. Um, the next thing is your vessel insurance. And this is becoming increasingly difficult to obtain and uh, very expensive um, in recent years. So if you're wanting to be fully insured when you're cruising um, uh, outside of Australia, <clears throat> you'll need to get in touch with your insurer and see if they will offer blue water insurance. And if they're not prepared to, some of the insurers won't offer it you'll need to find an insurer that does. And that uh, pool of insurers is pretty limited. Um, so anyway, if you want any more information about insurance and, and some advice to that, feel free to contact us via our website. The next thing that's new, well, it's actually not new, but it's become an, uh, uh, something that is being enforced now is the need to export your vessel when you depart Australia. 
So this has always been the rule, but it hasn't been enforced. But the Australian Border Force are enforcing it now. And essentially it means that when you leave Australia with your boat, your vessel is considered to have been exported. And that means when you return to Australia, it has to be re-imported. So to return to Australia um, and re-import, it doesn't mean you'll have to pay the GST and duty again. It just means that the vessel will be considered returning Australian goods. And as long as the vessel's value hasn't increased whilst it was away, so you haven't taken it somewhere and done a big refit, um, it's unlikely that you'll be asked to pay any duty or GST or anything when you return. <clears throat> so it's not that big a deal, except for the fact that, um, like most things government related, the process of doing it is very difficult to navigate. Um, so much so that most of those who have done it have, have taken the advice or wish they had taken the advice of the Australian Border Force and employed a customs agent to do it on their behalf. So um, if you want more information about this, just go to our website at that link that you can see there. We've got a number of uh, uh, documents there that you can, you can view and see what it's all about. And you can contact one of our, our partner businesses, DASMAC, who are customs agents, and they can help you get a better understanding of what's required. <clears throat> Again, if you haven't got what's called an EDN, which is an export declaration number, at the time of wanting to depart Australia, the Australian Border Force will not issue you with a outward clearance. So make sure you get this done uh, well in advance of your intended departure date. I've been contacted by boats that have gone to clear out and found out that they couldn't leave because they hadn't got the export declaration number and wanting to know how they go about doing it. So be aware of that. <clears throat> Personal and travel insurance, um, again, that's up to yourself if you're going to do it, but just be aware that um, uh, a lot of travel insurance isn't specifically tailored towards yachts. And um, you may well find that if you're injured whilst on passage um, and you arrive in a country and look to get uh, medical assistance and hope that your insurer is going to pay for the cost of treatment, you might find that you're out of luck because they'll say, well, the incident happened whilst you were outside of that country and therefore you're not covered your travel insurance was for when you arrived in that country um, so again i'm not going to talk for hours on this but you need to just make sure that you are actually covered for any injuries that happen on the vessel whilst you're on route to your destination um, offshore communications you're going to need to have some some way of getting weather and uh, and and or email whilst you're at sea and out of internet range um, and again, on our website, we've got different options in that regard. Uh, it's mandatory in Indonesia to have an AIS transponder. So that's send and receive and a working, and I'll emphasize working AIS transponder. So before you head off to Indonesia, you must make sure that you've got your AIS all working and sending and receiving signal. And then there's the other things, of course, you'll probably want to have a water maker. Um, you may, if you've, this is your first blue water sailing, uh, Adventure, you may want to consider your sail management and whether you need to put a third reef into your main sail if it doesn't already have one, um, and what you're going to, how you're going to manage reefing sails and, and your whole sail wardrobe. And of course, your standing and running rigging needs to make sure that's, that's uh, sound and up to the task. And uh, anchoring, you're probably going to spend more time on anchor than you've ever spent before whilst you're blue water cruising and you want to make sure that your ground tackle is is up to the task so um, safety equipment for the vessel life rafts and 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 all that goes with that uh, man overboard equipment and then of course for your crew we strongly recommend people that are going offshore have uh, completed a maritime first aid course um, along with a sea survival course and they've got the skills necessary to be able to navigate their vessel without the aid of a chart plotter. Uh, we had a vessel on one of our rallies a year or more ago up in the Coral Sea, what was hit by lightning whilst we were 300 or 250 miles off the coast and lost every bit of his navigation equipment. Um, and it, it, was, it would have been a challenging situation if he wasn't in the company of other vessels. So make sure that you know how you're going to be able to navigate your vessel if you lost your your uh, chart plotter or your charting software for any reason. 
we offer this offshore cruising preparation course for those who haven't been offshore before. Um, and it is a comprehensive introduction to offshore cruising. Basically, it, we like to say most people don't know what they don't know. And by completing this course, we're not training you to sail offshore. We're teaching you about the things you need to be aware of and prepared for and how to gain the information that you need in order to be well prepared. Um, the course is a series of one hour videos, 10 of them, which was actually a course we did before COVID. We were traveling around the country and doing it. And this is a recording of the course that was done over two days in the, at the venue. So if it's your first offshore venture, um, I think you'll find that to be very beneficial. We run a membership program, the Down Under Rally, so you can get access to that course. If you're a member of the Down Under Rally at $125 for membership for one year and $99 for each year after that. And that gives you unlimited access to those 10 one hour videos of the offshore cruising preparation course. It also gives you discounts and special offers on marine related products and services from our rally partner business, access to our members only portal, priority rally registrations. There's a whole heap of benefits there. Um, it'll probably be the, the best value for money you'll get for $125 when you consider the sort of money you have to spend on your vessel. So jump in and have a look at that. I think you'll find it'll be a, a very worthwhile and wise investment, especially if you've not been offshore before. We also publish this uh, Ahoy Sailing magazine. So it's free. We do articles on there about cruising the South Pacific as well as Australia and some on occasions up into Asia, Indonesia. So jump in there, have a look. If you like it, subscribe and you'll get it into your inbox every month free. So that's our website. Everything that I've just talked about, you can find on our website, um, navigate via the menus up in the top section there. And um, if we can be of any help at all, that's what we're here for. So we'll move on. I'm going to introduce you to Ray, Raymond LaFontaine, who is a friend of mine. Ray also is the owner, founder, developer, and uh, everything to do with Marina Del Rey in Indonesia. In 2006, Ray, was it? Yep. 2006. 2006, yes. 2006, we were preparing our, our vessel for our first offshore voyage at the Southport Yacht Club. And um, we were a couple of years away from being ready to go. And Ray showed up there and he was a couple of years ahead of us on his Beneteau. What was it, Ray? Basileia. Basileia. How big? Basileia. Yeah, 50, 51 foot um, Beneteau. And Ray and his girlfriend at the time were um, ready to go. They were at the Southport Yacht Club and just waiting for cyclone season to end to head off. So we spent um, quite a few enjoyable days and hours and, and had quite a few drinks over that period of time with Ray aboard Basileia um, and got to know him. And then we lost touch, as it often happens when your friends go cruising. And several years later, lo and behold, I see... Uh, something about Marina Del Rey and I see that it's Ray and Ray has found his way to Indonesia. He was intending to go around the world, but when he got to Indonesia as a surfer and someone who enjoys uh, the freedom of cruising and, and the uh, scales of economy that come with living in a country such as Indonesia, um, he identified an opportunity there for marinas because there weren't any. And he went about uh, developing Marina Del Rey. So, that's how I've come to be here today talking to you about Indonesia. We're not running a yacht rally to Indonesia. I haven't sailed to Indonesia, nor have I cruised in Indonesia. So I don't profess to know anything about sailing and cruising in Indonesia. And I have a, a philosophy that if I haven't sailed the route myself, I'm not going to be running yacht rallies and telling other people how to do it to those destinations. So we're not here to sell you to go on a rally. We're here to to give you some, some information about sailing from Australia to Indonesia, some of the different routes and how to overcome some of the challenges that, that those that have gone before you have faced uh, as a result of the routes that have been sailed. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand over to Ray and uh, he's going to say hello and we'll get into it. So over to you, Ray. Thanks, John, and great intro, mate. And um... Lovely, for, yeah, thank you for your help in helping us promote Indonesia as a destination. Um, good afternoon, everybody from sunny, warm Bali. Um, and so, yeah, we'll get into it. Basically, um, 
I left Australia. Just a quick bit of background. After meeting John, we sailed to Darwin and then went with then the Sail Indonesia Rally. And uh, on our way, we sailed into Kupang. So what we're about to talk about, I've done before. Um, and that's how I found my way here. We basically sort of departed the rally and went more along the south, co south coast of Indonesia. And lo and behold, I went surfing at a place called Desert Point, which any surfers may, surfers may know. It's, well, it's a world-class left-hand surf break. And fortuitously, um, I discovered uh, Marina Del Rey, or Gilly Gaday, and um, it's a part of the Southern Gilly Islands. Some of you might have heard Gilly meaning island. And we're on the big island called Gilly Gaday, which is Gilly Gaday Island. It's a natural shaped, uh, the island itself and the island surrounding it protect a very, very large bay year round. And I identified that place as a great place to build a marina because I sailed a lot through Indonesia and found it very difficult to leave my boat somewhere and sail back and fly back to Australia. So I saw a demand for it. And um, in 2010, 2011, we started, we, I started getting all the, pro, the, the permits and licenses and et cetera, et cetera. And in 2008, we started construction. Up until that point, we were sort of offering moorings in the bay. Um, by sort of October, 2019, we finished developing stage one, which is it, it, it's operating as it is now. Um, and then basically March came along the next year and we had COVID. So that sort of put us, put us back a couple of years, but um, everything's back on again. And uh, so John's offered to help me promote Indonesia as a sailing destination, which I'm very passionate about as have been linked here now for 15 years since 2000 and, and 2007. So, and just quickly, Ray, you got here, Marindo. Um, this is the this is the next stage of of development in Indonesia for cruising yachts. Yes. Yeah, that's right, John. Marindo is short for Marinas Indonesia. It's a company that I've we've formed, um, and along this suggested route that we're going to suggest, we, we're going to say there should be there hopefully well there will be a marina on the entry point from Darwin, which is a place called Roti Island, which is 40 miles south of Kupang, which is the normal place where boats enter into Indonesia to clear, do their clearance procedures. We're highlighted a location just 40 miles south of that on this beautiful island, which I'll talk about in a minute um, through, the pro, through the presentation. Um, then all roads lead to Lombok, being in the centre of Indonesia, um, where we've built our first marina. And then we're building another marina in the top of Banda Aceh, which is a little island called Sabang. And from Sabang, it's, you, you, it, it's a short distance, 220 miles or something, back to Phuket in Malaysia. There will be another one in, on the top of Manado in Sulawesi. And that is the entry point from the, if you're sailing from the Philippines, from Hawaii, from Japan and the rest of Asia. So we branded it, we're gonna rebrand it Marindo. That's what will become so. Well, I've cool. identified those locations because they make sense for, for yachties to enter and exit the country along plenty, the sailing route. Plenty going on for you in the future. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so why Indonesia, mate? Um, it's got 17,500 islands and would take a lifetime maybe to, maybe to see half of them. Um, it's a very diverse culture, something like 350 different languages spoken here. Very multicultural country um, that is extremely beautiful. Um, it's probably the last sailing destination on the world that still hasn't really been discovered. You can go to islands still to this day where um, the locals are still substance living. Um, and it's a, it, it's a bit like what I would imagine Captain Cook was felt like when he arrived in Australia back in the day. It's pretty much still like that in many areas. Um, it doesn't have any cyclones. And the, because it's 
it's six, eight degrees south of the and north of the equator. Um, the winds aren't strong like the east coast of Australia, um, so it's a, it's a it's a relatively easy, safe place to sail, um, and you've got enormous flexibility to go wherever you want. All right. So um, what we're trying to do is get people to actually cruise that rather than rushing straight off to Malaysia and, and Thailand and Phuket, but you know to take their time and cruise the place properly. So I think it's a wonderful place and I've sailed extensively in the Pacific and Europe and around Australia and that. I find it very easy here to sail. So we've got, as I mentioned earlier, we've got a bit of a mixed audience. Some are looking to come to Indonesia to cruise and spend, you know, as long as they, they, they wish to cruising in Indonesia and others are on circumnavigation. So they're, they're, they're in Australia now perhaps, or they're heading to Australia in some time in the future from the Pacific and they're looking to transit Indonesia. So we're going to talk about two lots of, of uh, options here. One will be for those that are looking to come to Indonesia and experience it and cruise, and the other will be for those that are looking to transit Indonesia. And that's what these routes that we're about to talk about um, are, are going to show you. So Ray, do you wanna just introduce the routes? Um, the routes we'll discuss in this presentation have been created to demonstrate what we consider to be the best for vessels planning on, tra on travelling from Bundaberg, Australia to Indonesia and possibly onwards to Phuket, Thailand and Malaysia. The route timing take, taken into account of the official, takes into account the official cyclone season in Northern Australia from November 1st to April 30th and are designed to take advantage of the Southeast trade winds across Australasia and Southeast Asia. In the making of this presentation, we have also taken care to include safe anchorages and minimise ocean passage distances, with the largest being 500 nautical miles between the anchorages along the southeast of Java. So, so th with that, guys, the, the cyclone season thing there, we were, we, some of you might have heard me chatting with Boyd earlier. Um, We've got, to, we've got to be cognizant of the fact that most people's insurance is going to dictate to them that they can't be north of Bundaberg before the 1st of May. Um, you know, many of the locals, Australian cruisers that have spent time up the Queensland coast will be prepared to, to move on before that. And perhaps their insurance is going to be a little less demanding than those who are visiting from offshore in that regard. Um, you know, you can leave earlier, obviously, it's just the, there is a risk factor and you need to be able to mitigate that risk if you do find yourself in a late season cyclone. Um, and I'm sure as when I was chatting to Boyd, uh, he would tell you there's, there's plenty of cyclone uh, shelter to be had as you cruise up the east coast of, of Queensland. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it's just playing the numbers. So if you're someone who likes to err on the side of caution, uh, typically, you're not going to be leaving Bundaberg until after the 30th of April. If you're someone that's got a little bit less, a little bit more of a tolerance for risk, you may find yourself heading off earlier. The, the, the thing here is there's a massive amount of Queensland to see. And if you've not seen it before, uh, it's such a shame to be rushing through from Queensland, from, from Bundaberg to Cairns and, and not experiencing, you know, the Great Barrier Reef and all of the cruising grounds along the Queensland coast. So it's a bit of a trade-off, but, um, you know, it, it is what it is. So everybody's got their own plans and their own missions. So as we move on, this is a, an overall of the, the route. So we'll get, we'll drill down into the, the, the Bundaberg to Darwin route in more detail, but Earlier, Ray spoke about the route and choosing which way to go. So, Ray, do you want to just give a quick summary of what we're looking at on the screen there? Yep. Um, you can see on the screen Bundaberg down the bottom on the right-hand side. Um, we're formally leaving there on the 1st of May um, and then taking time to get up to the top of Cape York and sailing through all those amazing places that I've done. And John's absolutely right. You, you can't rush through that. It's amazing. Um, and then turning left, turning to port around the top of Cape York. And then it's a 300 odd mile sail. You can see the distances in there to the Wessel Islands, the Wessel Island Group, Cape Wessel, where 
I've been to, and we'll show you some pictures. That's just an amazing place. There's plenty of safe anchorages there on the lee of Cape Wessel from the southeasterly trades, which we hope you'll have and enjoy sailing across the top. Um, from there, it's to Darwin to, um, to clear, clear out. And we've nominated, a, suggested a yacht club, um, which uh, is ideal for, for cruisers. Um, and you'll be able to organise then your clearance out. Um, and then from there, sail to Kupang. Kupang is the bottom of Timor. Um, that's a, a, an area where, well, that, that's the traditional place where yachts crew, uh, clear into. But I've done that before plenty of times. Um, and what we're suggesting is don't rush off straight away to go to Flores and Komodo, which many probably know, but to sail sort of 40 miles south and discover uh, Pularoti and the smaller islands in the southern area. Now, the reason why we're sort of keeping into the southern area is because we want you to have wind. And the further away you are from the equator, the stronger the wind, normally speaking. The southeast trades cling along the south coast of uh, Indonesia. And as well as that, these anchorages and uh, islands are stunning. Um, so Roti, then you can cruise up to Flores and Komodo and come around the top of Lombok. And there's some amazing islands in there. Um, or you can go along the south coast, all the way underneath those islands, and then come through the Lombok Strait and into Marina del Rey. Um, Marina del Rey is situated, as I mentioned before, it's surrounded by 12 islands. Most of them are un uh, uninhabited. Um, you've got the, the um, more famous ones in the top in Gili Truong and Gili Mino and Gili Air. And then basically from there, it's around the bottom of Bali, um, up into Jawa, and then sail along the south coast of Jawa. And you'll note there's a, there's a bit of a distance there of 500 miles. Um, because I've chosen these, 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 these locations because we'll have southeasterly winds. So you want good anchorages where they're not rolling and you can see that coast. And then it's crossing the Sunda Salat. That's between Sumatra and Jawa. We're suggesting, highly suggesting that you go and see uh, Krakatau, the famous volcano. It's now called Inak Krakatau, which means, Inak meaning the, the child of Krakatau. That cruising in that coast there is amazing. And then back out again, and then along the, um, the east coast, the west, sorry, west coast of Sumatra, um, there's a bit of a hike until you get to the Mentawi Islands. And then through the Banyaks, Pulania, Sibiret, there's, there's a hundred or so islands in there. Um, take your time, but it's beautiful. Plenty of anchorages um, that you can find there and then up to the top of Sumatra, and you'll find an island called Sabang. And um, that's an amazing group of islands as well. That's where we're gonna build another marina. And then from Sabang across to Phuket or Langkawi, Malaysia, which everyone seems to go, you've just bypassed the Malacca Straits, which is one of the heaviest shipping uh, routes in the world. Whereas you're still, if you're going along the outside of Sumatra, um, you're seeing all these amazing islands incredible coastline, um, but it's only a short two-nighter across to Phuket and, or, or Langkawi. So Ray, so you'd make... choosing mm. this route, you're, 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 you're bypassing, what well, you're not experiencing as, as much traffic as you would normally experience um, if you were yep. going to go through the Malacan Straits and the, and the, the shipping traffic, as well as the local fishing traffic and the, and the local commuting traffic. Um, this is a much more relaxed way of, of a more scenic route, yes? That's correct. And um, you're right, John. It, we've chosen this route, one, to utilise the wind, um, two, to avoid commercial traffic and fishing traffic and rubbish. I know Indonesia's got a bit of a reputation for that. Um, and, yeah, it's a much safer route from a point of view of collision. It's cleaner. There's less traffic. Um, yeah, that's the reason. Would you say because that if you're going these anchorages that you're going to visit and the towns and 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 uh, the places that are attached to those anchorages would be more authentic from an Indonesian uh, experience, less commercial? Totally, 
totally. And it's sort of the traditional, the old, the old, the current routes that have been sailed in the last, I say, 10 years, the islanders get used to it and it becomes a bit of a hassle. Um, it's authentic, real, real Indonesia. Yeah, excellent. Yeah. All right, well, we'll just jump on. By, by the way, I'll just back up quickly there. Ray talked about that that uh, passage from Cape York across to Darwin and said 308, <clears throat> excuse me, on our map there, it says 380 nautical mile. Um, that's the leg from Cape York to the Wessels. If you look on your screen, just to the top of the D in the word Darwin, you can see a little yellow um, marker, which is the, the top of the Wessels, Cape Wessel there. So that's the distance from the yacht pictured at the Cape York there across to the top of the D at Darwin of 380 odd nautical mile. And then you've got about the same distance again, Ray, from there to Darwin, haven't you? That's right, yep. Okay. Just and, you can cruise, and you can cruise all that coast. You can hug that coast, it's, it's amazing. There's just too much information to write in one map, but yeah, it's, it's brilliant. And for those, and, that, and, those that are going to go onwards from, from um, Indonesia and, and, and continue up into Langkawi and Phuket, this route that you're talking about, I imagine if they were to visit you at, at, at Marina del Rey on their, on their voyage, you'd be able to sit down with them with, with, their, with their chart plotting software and, and really give them some good insight into this if they were actually there and you could, you could sit face to face with them. Is that right? That's right, mate. I'd love to do that. Okay. Over a cold beer. <laughs> all right we'll see what's next okay i'll just quickly whiz through this and, and give uh, ray a little bit of a breather there so again just recapping we're talking about bundaberg to be considered by many the most southern area of the of the east coast of australia to be impacted by cyclones um and waiting there until the end of or, or making your way up to the Sandy Straits and waiting there until the official end of cyclone season is certainly not a chore. The area in Harvey Bay and the Great Sandy Straits uh, and the Lee of Fraser Island um, is a stunning cruising ground in its own right. Uh, and of course, you've got plenty of opportunities to provision there and to do repairs to your vessel, especially at Bundaberg Port Marina if you needed to get anything done along the way. So it's fairly convenient um, place and an enjoyable place to be waiting out the cyclone season so you can leave. Once we've, once we've headed north from Bundaberg, the end of the cyclone season, as Ray said, the trades are starting to establish themselves and you've got good sailing opportunities all the way up the coast at that time of year. Um, 325 across the top of Cape York to the Wessels, which Ray's talked about. Um, good shelter there in the Marching Bar Islands and, and a particularly good place to visit, especially for those that are yet to experience the more authentic um, Australian experience in regard to uh, the top end. Um, so yeah, it's really, really is a, a, a great opportunity there. There's a couple of routes you need to sail or you can choose to sail there. One of them is through what is affectionately known as a hole in the wall in the Cumberland Strait, which is doable, but care and local knowledge needs to be sought if you're going to attempt that route. So um, just, just, just decide which way you're going to go and, and, and start looking at your route planning. Um, so just keep the, the, the key thing about this route versus going over to say, I don't know, um, uh, Horn Island or Torres Island and departing from there, it keeps you close enough to the Australian continent to use the offshore winds at night as the trades blow slower. And it lessens, and, and more importantly, it drastically lessens the risks associated with dangerous encounters of fishing nets and debris that are commonly found in the northern parts of the Arafura Sea and have been problematic for so many cruisers in recent times. So the likelihood is of, of, of encountering these, these debris and these fishing nets and, and the vessels that go with them on this route is far less uh, risky than it is if you were perhaps to take the more northern routes that some are suggesting. Correct, Ray? That's 100% correct. All right. So said we were gonna drill down into this, uh, this, this route a little bit more from a perspective of leaving Bundaberg to go up to Indonesia. So the distances there you can see, and look, this webinar is being recorded, so you can come back and review this again at any time and pause it and, and revisit it. Um, so we won't go by one to one here, but you can see we've outlined the distances. And we're not suggesting you travel each one of these in a, in a single voyage, but just to give you some touch points as to how far it's gonna be between the major centers. So 
Ray, this is this is the Wessels, is it? When what you were talking yep. about earlier. Yep. That's a picture in the middle there of Kate Wessel. And you it's basically the 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 longest stretch from the north coast of Australia. So once you get around Cape Wessel, you're inside the lee of the southeasterly trades and there's a whole lot of islands there and there's some pictures of it. It's incredible that you've got there the picture of the hole in the wall that John was talking about and you need to have your tides very right for that because you won't get through it if the tide's going the wrong way. It runs at about 10 knots, but it's fun when it's going with you. The boat flies through it. So that's, that's a way of shortening the distance. So just look, just looking at the at the screen, Ray. Where are we from the hole in the wall perspective here? We well, can see my oh, cursor moving in that map chart. Look well, there. Kate, we Kate Wessel's the the, the 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 top of that picture. We what we're suggesting is you go around the top of the Cape, um, and it's a good sail. You got you'll have plenty of wind, and then you get around the corner, and then take take your time. That's very it's, much like um. um uh, Whitsunday Island and, and the Hill Inlet there, isn't it? Yeah. The, the, the sand's squeaky. It's just pristine. Those anchorages in that in that photograph to the left of the one that I said, like Hill Inlet, that looks like extraordinary anchorages in that big horseshoe there and, and all those bays. Yeah. But they're as good as they look, are they? Oh, mate. We, we, when we did it, um, we, had a, we had a bit of a blow. Um, we came around the outside of Cape Wessel and then anchored up in on the lee store shore and the Australian um, Navy were anchored up there and they came over and said what are you guys all doing here and we said well the same reason you are <laughs> we're keeping out of the wind <laughs> we needed a break so the fishing's excellent beware of crocodiles take a spear gun with you I have <laughs> all right I don't know if that's any good, but yeah <laughs> it's pretty 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 cool place this is where you, I mean, this is one of the options in Darwin for where you want to stage your departure, but this is the place that you feel is, is the most cruiser friendly and laid back and um, yeah. accessible. When I, when, when I went there, I sort of rocked up to the bar and um, anchored the boat, took the tender in. They've got a nice dinghy dock there, walked up and ordered a beer and he said, we can't serve you unless you're a member. I went, oh, that's not, what do you mean? I don't want to be a member. He said, no, it's look, mate. If you pay for five beers now up front, you're a member. And I think that's the why then they had the, the largest membership in all of Australia. <laughs> yeah. So we had a ball there and they, you know, it was great fun. And it's close to Darwin, the city. Um, and the city's great. Everyone should see Darwin. I'd never been to Darwin before up until then. And I was amazed at how good the place was. It's beautiful. All right, so you so, can you can you can you can anchor here. You can get a you can get a short of provision, um, and you've got access to obviously there's several marinas if you if that's the way you want to go. But uh, this is just one of the options that that you want to consider, and this is the one that that in Ray's opinion is is the most cruiser friendly. Yeah. Yep. Correct. Correct. All right. Um, so cruising routes and timings. Just to a quick recap before we move on. Depart Bundaberg, Australia, May 1st, 23. Arrive Kapang, Indonesia, 1st of August, 23. So that's that's basically what you've got to plan for with your with your route timings. How long are you going to spend at each place as you move along the Queensland coast? And you're going to have to keep moving um, to, to get it done and get get there. Um, so again, this is a guide. It's not it's not absolute. There's no rally. There's no time that you've got to be anywhere. You don't have to 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 adhere to any dates or leave anywhere at any particular time it's it's a guide we're, we're not trying to sell you on on joining a rally and doing things here we're just trying to give you some broad knowledge for you to be able to take it away um, yeah what, 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 what sorry john what, what i'm trying to do is to uh, uh set an example um that cruising in entering indonesia is simple it's and that's not, that's where we get to with this with this next slide right Sorry, right. Yep. So we're, we're clearance into Indonesia at Timor, official port of entry, and then you're encouraging everyone to get cleared in and, and clear out as uh, get cleared in and then move down to to Rodi for a much more pleasant anchorage and and relax there to recover from your passage and and just enjoy a bit of time before you move on. Um, yep. 
Yeah, and, and you've got access to Kapang with ferry transfers from Rody. So uh, good provisioning there. Um, everything that you, you're going to need to start your Indonesian visit uh, on the right foot. Uh, if you, and yeah. and less 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 overwhelming, I guess. Yes. Yeah, correct. Gives you it gives you a chance once you've done the the formalities in Kupang to go down to it's only like I said forty miles. There's a um, an anchorage there. Um, you can see the anchor in twenty five meters of water. It's pristine. I think we've got Beautiful. a couple of photos here for that. This is yeah. this is Rody, right? Yep. For the surfers, that's that surf break's called an umbrella, um, and you can actually anchor in there. Um, it's a safe spot to anchor, and you just take your boat over and great fishing as well. But you just take your tender over and go surf on the on the shore. There's some great restaurants and bars and stuff. And Roddy Island is a really pretty island, and highly recommend getting a couple of motorbikes and driving around it, as well as sailing around it, because you can sail right around it as well. And there are a number of smaller islands that are off it. It's just too much detail to show. It looks very specific, like, eh? It is, yeah. I was glad to get out of um, Darwin by that stage, and we are looking forward to the long passage. When we got to Kupang, that was okay. Um, but luckily we surfed, so we went, no, we're not going to go straight across to Flores and Komodo. By chance, because we like surfing, we, we found Rotti. And um, oh, I just love the place. And there's a couple of islands... There's a whole lot of islands there around there as well. So Kupang's a busy city, very busy city. There's an airport there. If you want to do um, crew transfers at that point, that's a good spot to consider it because there is an airport that's fed by um, uh, fed by Bali. So a domestic flight to there. So if you had crew um, joining you from the voyage over from Darwin to Kupang, they could come down and spend a few nice days here and relax with you, and then they could get their transfer back out of the country from Kupang, yeah? That's right, yep. All right, yep. we'll keep moving because I'm just mindful of time and this thing timing yep. out on us, and we want to make sure we've got time for some questions. So arrival formalities. Um, okay. Go on, John, you do it. So Marina, Marina Del Rey is an official port of entry, and as such, they've got the ability to provide visa sponsorship and uh, all of the up-to-date requirements in regard to the formalities that you're going to encounter, including visas. Um, so whilst you're not going to be clearing in at Marina Del Rey, if you are doing this uh, route that's being suggested and you're taking advantage of the offer that Ray's going to make shortly, you'll have his assistance and that of his, his company and his employees to help you navigate these these uh, formalities and visa requirements and so forth. And of course, the opportunity to attend a, uh, an event in Marina Del Rey round about in September, uh, where you'll get to have full access to the resort and the facilities of the resort, be able to leave the boat safely there and go and visit Bali um, and cruise in the Gili Islands. Uh, you know, it's, it's really uh, strategically located is, is the way to describe it from that point of view and a safe place to leave the boat whilst you can uh, get out and see some more of the, the, the mainland Indonesia, so to speak. Um, yeah, it's, um, it's only 50, 55 miles from Bali. People like to go to Bali. We run a ferry, uh, which is an hour and a half from Giligaday to Bali. Um, so leave your boat at the marina and then spend some time in the resorts in Bali if you want to. Lombok's also an amazing island. Um, and... That picture there with the flags and the boxing kangaroo, that's 2018, I think, or somewhere around then. That's the arrival of the World ARC Rally. So we put on a function. We had their, their local was stick the fighting. Or the, was it the oyster? Um, the oyster might, right? Yeah, probably. Uh, yeah. We, we, we've just, we just hosted that late last year, actually, the, the, the oyster rally. Yep. And they stayed for two weeks and had a ball. Cool. All right, again, just mindful of time. So what is it you're offering here, Ray? Um, okay, so because we're an Indonesian, Indonesian company, we will, we're offering visa sponsorship for $220. Um, and basically, we'll oversee the application for you because you can do it online, but we'll do it for you. And along with that goes the sponsorship. 
which our company would sponsor each every person to be able to get a visa. Yep. That's and it. that that's the major hurdles, is it? The visa and the and the um, sponsorship letter, yeah. Yeah, you need you need sponsorship to get your visa. So we're offering that, and we'll oversee that process to make sure there's no problems. So that so money, two hundred twenty bucks. I'm I'm also seeing here that included in that two hundred and twenty dollar Australian dollar fee for the visa yep. sponsorship and assistance with the visa application, you're going to get a a week free in your marina. Is that right? That's right, berthing. Yep. So you can choose to use that or not. Um, if if you just do the visa sponsorship and 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 decide to go on a different route and you don't end up at Marina del Rey, that would be disappointing for Ray. But at the end of the day, um, if you would like to go there, you're going to have a week of uh, of Marina berthing included. Um, and ideally, if you can time that around being there in September to take in uh, to participate in this this. Uh, events that you've got planned during September for the yachting fraternity. Is that right? That's correct. Awesome. That's correct. Anything more you want to talk about that? Um, oh, we've got a great yacht club there. We're really the only yacht club in Indonesia. We'll show the um, photos, eh? Yeah, right on. Okay. So this is this is an aerial of, of Marina del Rey and, and the bay, and I guess those boats that you can see outside of the pontoon there are all on moorings, Ray. Right? They're your moorings? Yep, yeah, well, yep. And then you've got the marina pontoon there going back in, leading into the resort. And your club. And so and we've got a security, full, full uh, four-star resort, uh, clearance port, of course, fuel, provisioning, groceries, alcohol, laundry, repairs. I mean, it's all there, right? Yep. And, then, access, and then a cruising ground in its own right with the 16 Gilly Islands around there. That's right, John. So this is more just photos of, of Marina del Rey, guys, so that you can get an idea of, of, of where this is and why it's so special and unique in Indonesia. What are we looking at there, Ray? Is that this one? Um, there, there's, there the, there's, third, there's 12 islands. There's some of the 12 islands that are within a five nautical mile radius of the marina. And they've all got great anchorages. Yeah, very pretty. Because also we're on the lee side now of the southeasterly trades. Very so pretty. it's calm. So I can, I can see why you were motivated to build a marina, mate. <laughs> yeah, well, it's it's to me it reminds me of the Whit Sundays. You know, I used to work in the Whit Sundays and sailed in the Whit Sundays, and and I love that place. Um, I think we're equally as good, if not better. All right. So again, more photos of the marina, pool, yacht club. It's it's, uh, it's very very comfortable. So you're home away from home. Um, Got a and, massage room there. And Those leaving, wanting a massage. Leaving the boat and returning home, you'll have boat minding facilities there. People that will mind the boats and, and tend to them. Um, you know, run the yep. engines and, and do all the things that need to be done while the boats are unattended. Obviously, we'd like you to stay at the at the marina as long as possible, long as you'd like, and we run a complete full service, so you don't need any crew on board. We'll run the engines, like you say. We can dive on the boats and give them a clean. We can uh, uh, organise everything. We've got a set. You can find out a lot of that information on our website. Excellent. More photos of the moon. Have a look at that pool. Hmm. I'd like to dive in there right now. Anyone else that's in southeast Queensland at the moment probably feels the same way. It's pretty damn hot here. All right. If we're going to be moving on, if cruising Indonesia isn't your primary goal, you're transiting, then the route that follows will just quickly give you an idea of what it's about. But ideally, stop in at Marina del Rey, get a hold of Ray and get him to have a look at your charts with you and talk you through the onward route, which is, which is this one here. Again, just feel free to come back and look at this at any time. Um, when you watch the recorded version of, of this webinar. So that's the presentation um, in its entirety. Uh, I'd like to just hand over now to anyone that would have any questions. You're going to need to unmute yourselves in order to ask questions. Um, or if you don't feel like the being in the public eye, you can just shoot an email off to ray at marinadelray.com or .co, I should say. 
uh, at any time and ask Ray anything you need to know. He's there to help you. And uh, obviously I think you can see that he's, uh, he, he's, he's invested in getting boats to come and experience what he, what he calls the real Indonesia. So over to you guys, any questions, comments? Yeah, hi, it's Stephen Canberra, Australia. Hello, Stephen, thanks for joining us. Good, thanks for the presentation, looks fantastic. Um, I was just wondering, I'm not quite ready to go this year. Um, what are the chances that this might happen again in 2024? I know that's a way away, but um, just planning ahead. Over to you, Ray. Yeah, um, mate, yeah, look, this is a this is the going to be an event that will continue. We we intend doing this every year. So yeah, no problem. Email you as well um, in the next short time, but that's great to hear. Yep. We want this to become a a, a, a big event. Um, so that. yeah, we'll, we know this is a bit late this year, but I understand your situation. But no, we're we'll re running every year. I imagine the only thing that would change, Ray, if there was other costs, if the costs associated with the visas and the, those sorts of things would be the only variables. What, what, what you're saying is you intend to do this year in, year out, and, and it's only just the costs that might vary. Yeah. Just a quick uh, sec follow-up. Um, I hear, I read different things about visas. Is it possible to get a, a three-year visa for your boat? It, oh, uh, good question. It is three years, mate. Um, when you when you when you arrive, you say you you sign a, a vessel declaration. You fill that online, or we'll help you. Um, that what that's saying is that you're allowed to import your boat temporarily for three years, and after three years, you've got to leave. You can go out and turn around and come back in again, but that's the point. And um, so your boat and all of its goods, all you don't have to pay any any um, any import taxes or anything like that for three years. Okay, but for people, it's still the- It's the still the visa system, yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah. thanks for that. No worries. Hi, it's uh, Chris Mega here um, from Melbourne. Just a question, for those who want to come and stay in Indonesia a couple of years and then return to the East Coast of Australia, how difficult is that and what time of the year do you do it? Um, Traditionally, you want to be back near Kupang um, around April, right? And then, from, which is the end of the cyclone season. And yep. then you, you go back to Darwin from there. Um, you want to move fairly quickly before the Southeast trades um, take hold to make it as easy as possible. Okay, so the start of the, of the season is when you come back. Yes. Yeah, I'll just yep. jump in there quickly. So if you can stage yourself to be at the closest port of exit out of Indonesia, so the shortest distance between there and Darwin, um, and you know, you, you're going to be able to make that passage in lighter conditions, you're probably going to be motor sailing it because you're going to be waiting for a relaxation in the trades um, and, and get that done and get back into Darwin and then just make your way back east from Darwin down the Queensland coast over the period of that cruising season, which typically you're just going to have to manage it in between the trade winds. It's a, it's a northwest monsoon now. And what happens is it gets, it gets to about next month, it goes into a transition period where the winds are light and fluky, um, but there's wind. Before that, you've got the northwesterly wind. So if you're leaving, say, Phuket or, or anywhere up further west, um, you come in, there's no cyclones, but there's a strong northwesterly um, uh, trade wind coming. So you use that to get down as close as you can to what John just said, then back to Kupan, and then clear out and dash across to Darwin. But you want to try and do all that around April, May, um, May, June. Then you're actually got, then you're on the east coast of Australia, um, and it's all good sailing then. So you, you don't go across uh, sticking in, in Indonesia as far east as you can go, clear yeah. out somewhere there and, and down to Thursday Island. Is that not advisable? Um, you can do that if you want, yeah. Um, just, uh, Ray, I'll just jump in there. The distance yeah. is, the, is the key there. Uh, sorry, was it, was it Glenn? Chris. Chris, sorry, Chris. The distance is the key. It, it, given that you're going to be... <laughs> 
typically going against the trades, be them relaxed or not, the shorter the distance you can make the ocean passage, the, the, the better from a point of view of being able to then um, reduce the amount of ocean passage time, as well as avoid those heavy traffic areas with the fishing fleets and the fishing nets and all that that go with it. Okay, John, thanks. The, 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 the south coast of New Guinea, Papua New Guinea, um, is littered with boats and fishing boats and lots of rubbish. The north coast of Australia is clean and there's not much traffic. So that's why we're suggesting it. The biggest challenge you'll have getting back down, Chris, is from is from from Cape York to wherever south your destination point is, because you're going to be in trade wind season. You're going to get there in sort of June, and have to to work your way south. And again, it's all just being patient, and waiting for windows, and taking the opportunities when you get them. Yep. I've got a couple of questions if I can chime in. Yes, please, Boyd, go ahead. Um, one is I was originally considering going across the top of the island, but Ray, you're suggesting that um, heading across Indo on the southern side is going to be cleaner and far more enjoyable. That sort of makes sense? Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, it seems pretty obvious from what you're saying there, so that's that's good advice. The other is um, visa, customs, immigration, all that nonsense. You're saying it's, it's uh, 220 bucks, I guess, per person. We're looking to check into Kupang um, and then transit Indo, now on the southern side of the islands, and to make our way to Phuket. So, do you have agents in the check in the check out area? We can organise that, mate. But I'm actually trying to encourage people to do it. They go their own way. Um, this, uh, so you rock up to Kupang and you walk into Customs and Immigration. There's a yes. there's a there's a very small fee of a percentage of tonnage of the boat. That's it. Yes. There's no other cost. The only cost okay. is getting the, getting the visa. The okay, boat. So it's, mm. it's a relatively easy process in Kupang, checking in and then also checking out for wherever yep. we end up checking it. Okay. That's because I've read some posts somewhere people are saying you've got to traipse all over town and you've got to go to this guy and that guy and his Auntie Mavis and have a coffee with someone else. It becomes a bit of an old deal, but you're suggesting it's a pretty straightforward process. Which it, is good. It, it, look, I understand what you, I understand that. You got to allow a day. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. You still got to do a bit, a bit of that. Yeah. But in in Kupang, um, I've got an agent there that can help. No worries. His name's Michael. He speaks, he's Indonesian. Um, he does it all. He did all the oyster rots, the yachts that came through late last year. No oh. problems at all. It all went well. Um, oh. if you just want to do it, just you know, stay on board the boat at night, rest, get up the next morning early, nice shirt on and you know, pants, <laughs> short pants. Yeah, and do yeah. your formalities, mate. You know, yeah. Put pants on. That's always a good thing when you go into an office. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They, no, no, um, they'll, they'll, they'll come out and have a look at the boat. Um, yeah. Just navigate that normally. They're, you know, it's fine. They're yeah, okay. okay. I actually have a number of an agent down there, but I might come back to you, um, right, with, with visas. Sure. That's so appreciate yeah. your uh, input, mate. Great value. Excellent. No, all right. you, you're in Phuket, are you? Yes, mate. Yeah, at the moment I am. The boat's on the hard stand in Airlie. It's right. been there since February, and I'm heading back in a couple of weeks to uh, get it back in the water and just start plodding away over here in sort of April, May, June. Part of the thinking, mate, you know, Shalong Bay, obviously, yes. and where you where you're clear in there, right? Yes. We're we're trying to do the same thing on these other marina destinations. Exactly the same thing. So there's one office, Customs, Immigration, Quarantine, and Harbour Control. And oh. you bring your paperwork along to the next desk. That's what we're endeavouring right. to do in Rotterdam. Yeah, yeah. So it's professional, that'd, simple. That'd, that'd be awesome. So, yeah. uh, mate, we'll definitely drop in and see you on the way through. Or it's, God knows when that'll be. But um, yeah, appreciate your, uh, your good advice, mate. It's excellent. Thank you. No worries, mate. Appreciate it. G'day, guys. Uh, so it's Mike here. How are you going? Was it Mike? Yes. Hey, Mike. How are you? Good, mate. Go ahead. Hey, Ray. I might be a uh, a year or two ahead, but um, I've got a boat in the Philippines that I want to sail, uh, roughly down to you and then back to uh, Perth. Yep. Um, do you know much about that? And could I get in touch with you later about doing that sort of route? 
Yeah, sure. No problems. That's uh, Philippines. So, you know, top of Sulawesi, there's a place called Monado. It's only yeah. 40 miles or 100 miles from the Philippine Islands. Um, definitely worth going in there. Um, if we've got the marina going, that'll be easy, but I don't know when that's going to be completed. But Monado is certainly a wonderful spot. Um, it's an international airport there. Plenty of place to anchor around those islands. I'll talk to you about it later, mate, but yeah, no problems. And then straight straight down to Lombok and on your way to Perth, easy. Yeah, I'd love help with uh, some of that route planning. And sure. how long can we leave a boat at, at your place for? Can you leave it for there for six years. or 12 months? Three years, mate. Okay, right. So you've got capacity. Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we have it. Well, we've got a lot of, we've got a bit, a lot of capacity now. But yeah, um, no problems. We've, we'll, we'll fit you in, mate. It just depends on how, you know, no problem. Yeah. We, we want people to stay at the marina, obviously, as long as they want. What's, hey, yeah, Ray, awesome. what's, the, what's, a, what's the average, say, for a 15 metre monohull um, for a night or a week berthing rate? For, for, for a month, it's about 650 Oz. For a month? Yeah. <laughs> okay. That's. Um, that's remarkable, given that we're paying that a week here. I've done a, I did a re some research in 2019 before we opened and surveyed 30 marinas around the area. And then I took an average of it and discounted it by 30%. So there you go, folks. Pretty affordable to leave the boat up there. Yeah. And then it's boat cleaning and all that stuff's not expensive. Not like, you know, if you want some welding done, obviously it's a lot cheaper than Australia. Very good. All right, folks. Well, look, please just reach out to Ray. I think as you can gather from this webinar, he's, he's not pretending to be anyone that he isn't. Um, he's a genuine fair income guy um, and he'd be more than happy to help you with any inquiries he can. So just jump onto the website or email Ray at Marina Del Rey um, and I'm sure you'll find him to be a wealth of, of knowledge and assistance. Anything you'd like to add, Ray? No, John, just thank you, mate, for your help, buddy. Oh, that's, my, that's my pleasure, mate, helping out a buddy. All right, folks, All right. thank you so much for your attendance and uh, safe sailing. We'll see you all somewhere sometime. Fair winds, everybody, fair winds.